This episode is brought to you by Takahitri. How do you know if your blues are actually depression? Or if the reason you can't focus is really anxiety? Takahitri is here to help. Within a week, you can have a virtual visit with a real psychiatrist who takes the time to listen to you and takes your insurance. It's real medical care for the most common mental health conditions out there. Ready to talk? Take the free assessment at talkiatry.com slash go. That's talkiatry.com slash go. But for a lot of times, and you know, we're going into the holidays here, so we're going to have a lot of interaction with family members. Oftentimes, if you can set realistic expectations, that is a healthy boundary. It's almost sort of an agreement that you're making with yourself that you are not going to expect this person to behave in a different way nor are you going to make a lot of effort in order to try and get that person to behave in a different way. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Robin, it's November. Yeah. Which I just found out the other day. This is like now a boundary thing. So no, N-O, Vember. Like say no in November. Apparently this is a thing. Say no to what? I mean, I guess that's the question, right? It's about setting boundaries, I think. And for me, of course, when I hear about boundaries and people setting boundaries, I always want to make sure that we're not doing this all or nothing thing. So we're going to talk about boundaries. That's what we're going to talk about. Healthy boundaries. That's something that sounds simple, but I don't think it is. I'd love to dive deep with you to uh, help deepen my own understanding and learn what that is, because I think that phrase is probably misused a lot. And I sure as heck hope you didn't do a clinician research on Pinterest and other social (laughs) media. (laughs) Oh, but I did. I knew you would. Yeah. I mean, this is the problem is that when we're talking about boundaries, as in many things, when I hear this all or nothing stuff going on, when I hear like this real sort of almost militant setting your boundaries, that gives me pause because it's got to be more nuanced than that. Say more what you mean. Do you want me to tell you what what I found on Pinterest? (laughs) Okay. And I think that let's just repeat, this was not an academic journal. Where did you find this? I got them off Instagram. I did a search for boundaries, the word boundaries on Instagram and Pinterest. I'll just give you a few of the highlights of what I found. Okay. And I don't often do searches on Pinterest and this just verified why. This confirmed, this validated why I don't do searches on Pinterest. One time I searched my own name on Pinterest. That's a whole nother story because man, That was something. Okay. And every listener just went to Pinterest to do (laughs) that right now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay. Here's one, one thing that says, you have the right to say no to the things that don't serve you. I was like, really? Okay. Another one said, say no to the things you don't want to do. You are too valuable to say yes to things you don't want to do. And I was like, really? That's what a boundary is? Saying no to things that you don't want to do? That's not how I understand boundaries. That's not how I understand healthy boundaries. I hope we're going in the same place here. Because I absolutely agree that people should learn how to say no and not do things they don't want to do. But boundaries are a, a much bigger interpersonal dynamic. Correct. And also... I have to do things I don't want to do all the time. Do you want to know why? Because I'm a (laughs) grown-up. And I'm a self-employed adult. And I have children. And I have a husband. And I have a cat. And I have parents. And I have siblings. I don't make my decisions about what what I say yes or no to just based on whether or not I feel like doing it. That's not my criteria for how I say yes or no. Sure. That to me is a very immature criteria. 
So here's what I found when I was looking up the definitions of boundaries on Instagram and Pinterest. They struck me as very immature and not nuanced and a lot of times really sort of self-focused. So I agree with you is that healthy boundaries is a lot more nuanced and it's much more of a skill that we develop over time. It's not about saying no to the things you don't want to do. That's not how I define healthy boundaries. I mean, I know obviously as grownups, we're both self-employed people. And I take your point about we have to do a lot of things we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of things people think they have to do that they really don't have to do. Correct. And I always bring up the PTO. <laughs> you don't have to do the PTO. You just don't. Every time you get one of the gazillion emails from a school or something asking for your time, there are people who do not know how to say no. Correct. So for me, that's what healthy boundaries are, is that how do I differentiate between the things I really don't have to do? And sometimes those are also the things I don't want to do. And the things that sometimes I have to do that I don't want to do that are necessary, maybe because it's important in a relationship. Maybe it's because it's important to my job. Maybe it's because it's important to other people or this or that, right? I saw somebody post recently, if I am too much for you, then you are going to come up against a hard boundary. A lot of this boundary talk, and I wonder if this is sort of November is sort of spurring this on, sounds kind of aggressive and sounds, sounds kind of militant, which is very different than figuring out what works for you and how do you say no to things that, that are not necessary for you to do. It goes back again to all of the times we talk about seeking approval and being a people pleaser and all that kind of stuff. That's how I think about it. So I think we've clarified there is a category of things we don't want to do that we do have to do because we're grown-ups. That's right. Now let's talk about the things we don't have to do and we don't want to do, but there's still a voice in someone's head feeling like they should. They're shoulding all over themselves. Mm -hmm. I should do this because some sort of acceptance, some sort of guilt, whatever. If you can differentiate between what you do have to do and don't have to do, you should exercise a lot of choice of the things you don't have to do. Well, and setting healthy boundaries oftentimes means that you're going to disappoint somebody or you're going to experience disapproval from somebody because you're not getting sucked into a pattern or to a family dynamic or to your need to please everybody. So somebody's going to be disappointed. In order to set healthy boundaries, you've got to accept that somebody might not be so happy with you. Learning to disappoint and to tolerate disappointing others is an incredibly critical adult skill. That's right. I remember hearing a woman say this on stage, and that was her phrase. You have to learn, let me disappoint you. Mm -hmm. An audience of women all gasped. Yeah, probably it was a play on that song, right? Let me entertain you. And I think sometimes, particularly as women, we feel like we have to make sure that everybody's okay, that we're not disappointing anybody. The other thing, too, that we need to put out there, too, is that if you are raised in a family that doesn't have boundaries, if you are raised in a family in which you're not allowed to say no, which you're not allowed to disappoint people, then as an adult sometimes and as a parent sometimes, it's really hard to exercise that skill because it doesn't feel like the right thing to do. It, you feel like a bad person. When we come back, I want to talk more about this and the way healthy boundaries are there to protect us in our family relationships. Okay. We like certain brands and certain things as a family, and I often go to three different types of grocery stores. With Thrive Market, you can shop for everything you need. You can get your healthy pantry essentials, your meat, seafood, non-toxic cleaning and beauty products. How about that? All delivered right to your door. And if you find a price that's lower elsewhere, Thrive Market will match it. 
Thrive Market carefully vets each and every item, so you can trust if they sell it, it's probably the highest quality available. They have over 5,000, 5,000 food, home, beauty products. Finding what you need is easy with Thrive Market. So if you're looking for plant-based, keto, gluten-free, zero waste, BIPOC-owned brands, Thrive Market has you covered with favorites like 7th Generation Cleaning Supplies and Bob's Red Mill Gluten-Free Flowers. Get convenient, high-quality, affordable groceries delivered with Thrive Market. Join Thrive Market today and get a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks to get a free $60 gift. It's thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks. Lynn, I know you know this about me. I'm obsessed with gut health. Well, we all should pay attention to that. I've been fascinated by the amount of research coming out. Our gut is such a key part of our entire well-being. I think it's the most exciting area of healthcare to watch over the next few decades, too. Yeah, I mean, there's always new stuff coming out. Our microbiome holds so many data points about our health. We should be nourishing it. But I want a product that's backed by research, which is why Ritual makes sense for me. Well, Ritual's Symbiotic Plus contains two of the world's most studied strains with over 350 publications of human clinical trials. I mean, that's research. Yeah, that's research. That's what I'm talking about. They're science-backed. They're research stacked, especially when stacked up against the leading direct-to-consumer and top-selling probiotics on the market. But it's not just a probiotic. It's a three-in-one with clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. What's also cool about this, one of the reasons I like it, is that no refrigeration is needed for this minty capsule. And so for the two of us, we travel quite a bit. So not having to refrigerate the product is really important to both of us. Absolutely. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. There's no more shame in your gut game. That's why Ritual is offering our listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash fluster to start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. Okay, we're back. So Lynn, when I think of boundaries, I've had two conversations with very close friends recently that had a lot of similarity. And they're both women friends of mine who have a relative that has hurt them many times over the years. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to each of them, slightly different details. But the essence of it, the end of the conversation was... I hear you describe the pain that this person consistently brings to you, a certain type of rejection and inability to show up emotionally, right? We all have some relative who does something like that. Mm -hmm. So I said, you have all the data that you need about this person. What are you doing with that data to protect yourself when you engage with that person? Because it sounds like you know this will happen, but you go in to get sucker punched every single time. You know about this person. What do you need to do to protect yourself? If we know certain things about people, how do we make choices then that protect us? Because the injury can just be a repeated pattern over our whole lives. So I think a lot of times setting healthy boundaries has a lot to do with setting realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. There are some people that you just really do have to set a hard and fast boundary with, right? There are some people that you say, I no longer want to have a relationship with that person. That person has done things or that person has injured me in such a way. This is not going to get better. And every time I'm around that person, this is the outcome I get. So you set a hard boundary with that person. But for a lot of times, and you know, we're going into the holidays here, so we're going to have a lot of interaction with family members. Oftentimes, if you can set realistic expectations, that is a healthy boundary. It's almost sort of an agreement that you're making with yourself that you are not going to expect this person to behave in a different way, nor are you going to make a lot of effort in order to try and get that person to behave in a different way. And the third step, you know the way that person will behave 
And the goal would be to remain emotionally detached from the reaction you've previously had. Mm -hmm. If you have a sibling who always is really nasty to you and always gets you really upset, wouldn't the goal then be to tolerate this person's personality, but not emotionally feel like it's penetrating and that it's upsetting you? There she is being that person. Mm -hmm. And I am not reacting. Right. Because remember, when we treat something that's repetitive, and we say this about anxiety, we say this about what our worry says to us, it also has much relevance to our relationships. But when we treat something like it's breaking news, but it's actually a very predictable pattern, then that's what we have to shift. Right? So as Michael Yapko said, there is a difference between something that impacts you personally and something that you take personally. If you're going to try and have a boundary that's somewhat nuanced, right, you're not going to completely shut this person out of your life, then as you say, how do you not be surprised when they do the thing that they do? And how do you not let that push your buttons or injure you? Have I told you this story, Robin, about the woman who was abused by her father and then had to go and deal with her grumpy father-in-law? Tell me. So this is a woman I saw many years ago, and she was badly abused by her father. So she didn't have a relationship with her father, but as an adult woman, and she had children, her husband's father, her father-in-law, was a insensitive, gruff jerk, for lack of a better word. And so she would have to see him. And part of the problem was, is that she said, I need to learn how to have boundaries because in the relationship in her family, there was an extreme lack of boundaries that resulted in a lot of trauma for her. So she had to figure out how to set boundaries. And her first instinct was, I don't ever want to be around this guy. But she had to. And it wasn't, he wasn't an abusive guy. He wasn't her father, but she had to figure out how to do it. So I took a piece of paper. I took an index card. I wrote on the index card, he's a jerk. She folded it up and put it in her pocket. And when she went to their house for Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever, and her father-in-law was being a blowhard, she would put her hand in the pocket and she would just play with the little index card that had that message from me on it. And what that did is it allowed her to create a healthier boundary with him, something that she didn't really know how to do. So when he was being a jerk, when he was being a blowhard, she didn't mistake that for the relationship that she had with her father. It didn't trigger her as much and she was able to differentiate. And then she had to decide, well, how do I want to deal with my father-in-law, right? What are the healthy boundaries that I want to put up around my father-in-law? Not seeing him wasn't going to be a healthy boundary, nor a necessary boundary, but not getting sucked in or getting into an argument with him or taking his comments personally, that was a boundary that she had to learn how to erect, and she did. But she needed a little reminder in her pocket just to keep her present and just to keep her connected to her current healthy boundaries rather than get sucked into her past trauma. Well, in other episodes in the past, I believe we did a few for the holidays. Definitely in 2020, we talked about the family legacy around emotions. I think it was called Unpacking Your Family Baggage. Mm -hmm. And then we did other episodes on difficult relatives around the holidays. Mm -hmm. Remember, we did an episode during COVID about the people you don't have to see over the holidays. That you were like, psych, I don't have to <laughs> yeah. see them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, right. So in past episodes, you've referenced a couple of other strategies for mm -hmm. similar situations. One is that there was the mother-in-law who had annoying habits mm -hmm. where the couple then paid themselves a certain amount of money in a jar every time the mother-in-law sighed. Right. She would passively guess it's like she would go, ah. and so every time she did that, they got a dollar and then they could go out to dinner only using the money in the jar, which sort of paradoxically made them sort of look forward to the sighing. One of the things that this gamification or the he's a jerk written on a note card, it's helping someone create that emotional distance from something in the moment. Right. When we have that emotional distance and we can externalize, well, there's that part showing up. There it mm -hmm. is again. 
that's just kind of that place we all want to work to be in most of the time. Right. If we think about healthy boundaries, if we think about what that means, it can mean many different things. But in this more nuanced way of looking at it, so we're not cutting complete contact off with somebody, which again is appropriate in situations, I totally get that, but it really means that you are not going to take the bait. You're not going to take the emotional bait. You're not going to let them put salt in your wound, whether they were the ones that created the wound or it's an old wound that you carry with you. So that's what that emotional, a little bit of that emotional distance does. It also is really helpful if you have an ally in this, you know, your partner or your sibling or whatever, so that you feel like you've got some support. They become literally like the person that stands next to you that you can sort of needle in the ribs with your elbow or poke under the table so that we're all recognizing that this is what this person does and it's not about me. This is not about me. Right. You said something in another episode that I just loved that I think is worth repeating as we approach the holiday season. If we have a relative who tends to be very critical and shows up and finds the dirty spots of your house, Mm -hmm. you have to remember that she shows up to all houses and does that, not just your house. So when she shows up at your house and makes a comment about seeing dust here or there or whatever it is, you just don't need to go there. You just don't need to play. This is something that she does. It's about her. It isn't about you or your house. So it's really healthy to just say, well, there it is. There's that part of her. Right. Yeah. Every time she says that critical thing, then you have earned a little prize later, as long as it's not wine. You can go back and listen to that episode too. The reason that I like to make things a game, the reason that I like to keep things sort of in this category is that it it allows us to be observers rather than getting sucked in. And when we are setting boundaries with people and we become observers of their behavior, then we don't get sucked in. And you're right. And maybe if they go to their friend's house and they see dirt in the corner, they don't say it out loud to their friend because they're more comfortable saying it to you than they are. They're more polite at their friend's house. But this is a judgmental, critical person who's going to just spew their stuff wherever they find reason to spew it. Yeah. Do you feel like as someone who knows this information well, do you feel like you have developed skills that prevent you personally from getting sucked in in most of your own interactions? You've been a clinician for over 30 years and you know this information. Mm Mm-hmm. What percentage of times do you think you have boundaries that protect you that other people might get the scab ripped open? What's learned? What do you achieve? And what's, what's a human realistic level of this work? Mm-hmm. I would probably say 35% of the time I get sucked in. Uh-huh. But maybe two thirds of that time you're aware of it and you, you don't play. I don't play. I'm pretty good at figuring out the patterns of people. I mean, I have clients that sort of can do this, right? I mean, I've talked about I had this client that could never take responsibility for anything. And even when he screwed up, he still blamed me. I just wasn't going to play. Did it still irritate me? Yeah. Was I still sort of in disbelief, which I shouldn't have been, about how consistently he (laughs) engaged in his pattern? Yes. So I would say 30, 35% of the time, I can sort of feel an emotional hit sneaks past my boundary. Right. Well, I just think it's important to know that this isn't all or nothing. We're no. all human. And what does knowing this stuff and putting it into practice actually look like? Well, and here's the, the critical part of it. I don't do things perfectly, but my goal is to recognize it and then be able to get back on track as quickly as I can. So say say something happens where, you know, somebody crosses a boundary or say somebody does the thing that they do and I get sucked into it. My goal is to have a quick post-game analysis and to be able to say, oh, that thing happened again and then pull back from it. My mother-in-law loves to talk about tragedies that happen to people that we don't know. And also she doesn't 
ever ask a question about our lives. She might ask a question about her grandsons. I don't even think she knows what I do for a living, to be honest. So she's really not listening to the (laughs) podcast. She's really not (laughs) listening to the podcast. For years, it just was astounding to me that she had absolutely no interest in my life. Now it's kind of amusing to me, right? I remember I called her because there was a problem. My husband, he was missing. He hadn't come back from a hike. It ended up he had food poisoning in the woods. Um, He was trying to get back, but he felt terrible. But I called her sort of last ditch before I called the police. It was 11 o'clock at night. And she started doing her thing. She started talking to me about this woman that got robbed like eight years ago. And I just held the phone and I just listened to how long she would go on about it. And it was several minutes. And finally, I said, I'm sorry, I need to go because I need to find your son. And she was like, oh, oh, okay, okay, goodbye. It still sort of astounds me, but I don't let it bother me. I'm not surprised by it. I don't think about it. I don't ruminate it. I don't try and figure out why she does that. I just know she's going to do it. And I have some really good boundaries with her in terms of how much she is engaged in my life. I don't think I knew in all of her wackiness that you've described. Mm -hmm. She doesn't even know what you do for a living. Um, So I get that. She's just not curious. And she just talks about other people who've been victims of crimes. Yeah. You were on Good Morning America for your book, and it would have been awesome if she had had the TV on, and she's like, what? Yeah. Wait, she looks vaguely familiar. Yeah, that's right. Do I know that person? <laughs> she's going to come here for Thanksgiving, and there's a stack of books in my living room because they give me like 80 of them to do for promotional stuff. She's going to be very surprised. So here's the game I'm going to play, to be honest, when she comes here for Thanksgiving. I will wonder if she will even notice that my name is on that book. She may not even notice. No, she won't notice. Yeah, that will be interesting. I'll report back to everybody. I really think just to sort of go back and reiterate all all this, I don't mean to sort of throw my mother-in-law under the bus, but she's such a good example of a person in my life that I have healthy boundaries with. Right. I have realistic expectations, you know, whatever word we want to use, but the way that she will invade my space is if I have different expectations about what she's capable of. That's how it will feel like she is intruding in my life. Right. Is if I have unreal expectations about what she's capable of. Well, that's why like expectations and data, you know, when I was talking with my friends, it's like, you've got data. You've got all the data Mm -hmm. you need to know exactly how every interaction will play out. Right. Don't act like every interaction is the first one. Correct. And I think the reason that people do that is because we do tend to keep hope alive, right? I mean, we want it to be different. We want to find a way to show them that they're doing this to us. We want to prove our case. We want to get them to understand. And once you let go of that, it's sort of if you have an addict in your life, right? That one of the things you have to accept is that they are going to continue their behavior until they for whatever reason, are not going to continue their behavior. And it's not your job to try and convince them that their addiction is impacting you. You don't have to do that. That's a healthy boundary to set. You keep going into it over and over and over again, thinking that you're going to be the one that's going to change things. And that's how you get sucked in. And that's how it feels so exhausting and also so intrusive into your life. It's a hard thing to do. When we come back, I would love to hear a little bit more about families with no boundaries and what that actually looks like. What does that phrase really mean for our listeners so that we'll see whether or not we recognize that in our own homes or in the homes we were raised in? Gifting is hard. Bombas makes it easy with socks, underwear, and t-shirts that feel good and do good. They feel good because they're thoughtfully designed with the softest materials, and they do good because for every item you purchase, Bombas donates another to someone in need. I love this about Bombas because my kids have always known that their stocking every year is filled with underwear and socks. 
And I love the fact that when we do this, we're actually helping families in need. Yeah, I think it's a sign of getting older that I am thrilled when I get underwear and socks these days. And if I'm going to get Bombas, all the better. Bombas socks, underwear, t-shirts, and slippers are cozy upgrades to everyday basics and the perfect gift for everyone on your list, including yourself. Bombas uses materials like premium Pima cotton and ultra soft, never itchy merino wool in their socks and t-shirts and fuzzy Sherpa lining in their slippers. Bombas holiday collection puts a modern twist on traditional festive colors and designs. With family sets, you can match everybody up in exceptional comfort and style and hello, frameable holiday gift photo. <laughs> and did you know that socks, underwear, and t-shirts are the three most requested clothing items in homeless shelters? That's why Bombas donates one item for every item you buy. So far, Bombas has donated over 75 million items of clothing. That's a whole lot of comfort and a whole lot of good. Go to bombas.com slash flusterclux and use code flusterclux for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash flusterclux, code flusterclux for 20% off Bombas.com slash Flusterclucks, code Flusterclucks. This episode is brought to you by Delicious Bear Snacks. Between cryotherapy, goat yoga, and smoothies made with things you can't even pronounce, wellness can feel a bit complicated. But there's a simpler way to wellness. Bear Snacks. They're a tasty, crunchy snack made simply of apples. With Bear Snacks, less is more. Buy Bear Snacks now at most grocery retailers nationwide. Okay, so now back to the show. So a family that doesn't have boundaries, it means that you don't have space, and more figuratively than literally, you don't have space to figure things out. You don't have space to feel your feelings. So we've talked about that in the past. What happens if somebody says, you know, you're, you don't have a right to this feeling? Here's an example of a family that doesn't have boundaries a family that I worked with, and the teenage daughter would be upset about something. Whatever it was, you know, it didn't even matter. And maybe she had an argument with her mom. I remember there was a big fight about what dress she was going to wear to a certain event, and the mom thought it was inappropriate, and she didn't think it was inappropriate. And she would say to the mom, because we've worked on this, I just need some time to think a little bit so that I can have a conversation with you in a few minutes, or we can have a conversation in an hour. This mom would not tolerate that. This mom said, we need to discuss this right now. You are not going to walk out of this kitchen. You are not going to go into your bedroom. If the girl went into her bedroom, the mother would come right in and say, we need to talk about this right now. And it was really hard for this mom to give her daughter the emotional space to just sort of get her thoughts together and process it. So that's a way that it shows up in relationships is that you don't give somebody the space to sort of think about things and process things. The other way it shows up is that in a family where a child is not allowed to disagree with a parent's opinion, is not allowed to express their own opinion, in extreme cases, if we've got a narcissistic parent, the child needs to be a reflection of the parent, is always out in the world sort of representing the family, when children are, aren't allowed to respectfully disagree, when they're not allowed to say no in their family, when they're not allowed to set a boundary in their family, interestingly, the research shows that they have a very difficult time managing peer pressure as they move into adolescence. So you've got to be able to practice your no muscle. And that's what I talk to families about. If a parent says, oh, she's so disagreeable, or she refuses to do things, or she's so stubborn, I want to talk to that family about the ability to differentiate when do you do something because it's a responsibility you have to bring in the trash or you have to help out in this way, but when can you disagree, when can you say no, when can you refuse an invitation to go somewhere, all of those opportunities help a young person practice the no muscle. If you're an adult and you can't say no, you say yes to everything, you're a people pleaser, you do the PTO, even though you don't want to do the PTO, you agree to do this thing and you regret it. That very often, if we look back, that person hasn't had a lot of practice setting those boundaries early on. 
It also happens with siblings. So in a family where there are no boundaries between siblings, this is one of the things where an older child has to always share their things with a younger child, that the older child has to go to bed at the same time as the younger child, that the older child is told over and over and over again, you have to make this sacrifice or you have to do this thing for a younger sibling. Oftentimes that child won't learn that it's okay to have things to themselves, for themselves, to say no and to to differentiate between them and other people. So that's another way that it shows up. So I love all those examples and it's helping me really understand, a, I think, a broader, more applicable definition of what a boundary really is. Mm-hmm. Because a boundary, you can correct me, but it's really, it's giving someone the autonomous state of all of their emotions. Mm-hmm. It's allowing those emotions and it's not denying anyone those emotions in that space as well. Right. And that's a sophisticated, almost if we want to say that, it's a sophisticated view of boundaries because then there are also families where there's no boundaries. So there's there's physical violations, there are sexual violations, right? I mean, that's the real extreme of having no boundaries. And that there is a real confusion of whose role is whose in a family. So you've got a child who's parentified. You've got a parent who is got a severe alcohol problem. And so uh, a child in that family becomes the parentified child. So there's no boundary between who's, um, who's the parent and who's the child. So there's all those real extreme situations that happen in families where, and then it gets confusing because how do you learn how to say no if as a child you were expected to take on very big adult responsibilities? And and oftentimes, sometimes that feels good, right? So that becomes one of your superpowers, that you're so capable, you're responsible. People talk about, oh my gosh, you can handle all this stuff. And then it's hard for you to set boundaries because it's flattering when somebody says, you're so capable. Because nobody said to you, you're a little kid, you don't have to do this. So it gets very tricky of figuring out, like you said, what am I allowed to say no to? Where am I allowed to say I'm not responsible for that? Gets very confusing in families where there's not, where where there's a real confusion between who's the adult and who's the child. Well, it sounds like you're talking about somebody we both know. (laughs) You know, I don't know if you were intentionally looking at me through the camera, but you know what you said applied a lot to my own family of origin and mm-hmm. i do feel like i have a very healthy sense of saying no mm-hmm. um to things and i'm learning more all the time and i think that's mm-hmm. the the great answer is that it's a skill that we can constantly get better and better at that's right i i write about this i don't even remember which chapter it is in the anxiety audit where i write about the ability to say no that that's a skill you develop and it feels good to say yes. It feels good to be agreeable. It feels good to be the person that everybody says, oh, ask Lynn to do it. She'll do it, right? Oh, ask Robin to do it. She can handle all of this. All of that is very compelling, it can make us feel worthy. And it really is, like you were saying before, that ability to disappoint, that ability to say, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. Or as Phoebe in the first episode of Friends said, I really wish I could help you, but I don't want to. So so being able to, to, to recognize that is a skill that develops over time. And the first few times you say it and realize it's okay, it mm-hmm. becomes gleeful to say no. It does become gleeful. I remember going to my child's school And my boys both went to this little school for first, second, third grade. It was lovely. The teachers were lovely. It was just a wonderful place. But I was starting to work again after having taken time off when my boys were little. So, And I was doing a little bit of traveling. And there was some event that I was... (laughs) that they were doing that honestly, like I had no desire to do it anyway. It had to do with some dancing or something like that. Nothing against dancing. It just wasn't my thing. And I I said, no, I couldn't do it. And I got sort of a, a look from one of the moms like, okay, well, you know, I mean, it would be helpful if you participated. I felt so guilty. I felt so awful. 
And then I felt really good that I didn't have to do it. So I had to work through that guilt. And then I was like, oh, thank God I said no. Right. Because if you were, if you just smiled when she said that and you were like, yep, I'm sure that's true. (laughs) (laughs) Really cheery. Yeah. (laughs) That's crossing into another line. Because I think you've said in another episode, if we don't have a sense of guilt, that's also what makes us a a psychopath. Sociopath. Yeah. Right. 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 Either one. You can pick, pick your poison. But yeah, I mean, guilt is there when we've done something wrong. So, so guilt is there when we've truly done something wrong that we need to make amends for. I think a lot of times moms feel guilt for all sorts of things that don't really meet the definition of, of guilt, which is that you set a boundary because it's not something that you need to do. It's not something that you want to do. And you saying no isn't really going to impact people that you really care about. It's okay to say no. I was just having this discussion with my husband this morning because we're looking at my schedule for the spring and this fall has been a bit busy for me and I'm a bit worn out, to be honest. And I said to him, we really have to be careful that my fall doesn't get really booked. I don't want to do what I've done in the past. We had a conversation about how to make sure that doesn't happen. You got to work on it all the time. I'm an old lady who's been doing this for 32 years, and I still have to consciously talk to my husband who runs my business about saying no. First, (laughs) when I think of the tips that you give for November and what we should be thinking about, Mm -hmm. can I add my own? Please do not look for mental health inspiration on Instagram, Pinterest, or TikTok. That's a very good piece of advice. I will tell you that there is an enormous amount of TikTok and YouTube and Instagram stuff that is really informing young people about mental health. And a lot of it is just so unbelievably wrong. That's not the good place to go for your information. About mental health or sex, right? Yeah. Wait, wait, there's sex stuff on TikTok? (laughs) I got to check that out. I haven't looked up that. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to search myself on Pinterest. Maybe you could give me something else I should search that would be more interesting. Isn't there a Lynn Lyons who's an erotic novelist? Oh, well, not anymore. I mean, you know, I wish her well. When I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. So here's what happened. So my website used to be- She crossed Lynn- your boundary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm away. done with her. I'm done with her. I took her down. No, when I went to get my website, when I went to get lynnlyons.com, you know, years and years and years ago, that was owned by somebody. And so for a long period of time, my website was lynnlyonsnh.com, which is why my email still has that in that. Then it became available. So now it got switched to lynnlyons.com. But lynnlyons.com, before it was my website, was erotic writing with a sensual twist. (laughs) If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community. And we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn. Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better.